there really are probable cases of gradualism. In some ways, it depends if the, if the fossil is a very simple one, changes are small, because that's all really that the genetics can really do. But here's a, a very famous example from the late 80s by Paul Sheldon. He's a, he's a colleague of mine in, in the UK. He, he published this quite a great paper, actually, in Nature. And he looked at trilobites in Wales, okay, where, near where Darwin was. And here is time going up like this, but it's stratigraphic levels, but that meaning time. And he counted the number of little, little ribs here on the tail of these trilobites. Okay, little ribs. So it's, but he counted the same thing in all these different species, and he found that the numbers of ribs did change. Okay, so if you take a rib as as increasing or decreasing in numbers as a gradual change, well then this is gradual change. Okay, now whether it's really is gradual change, that's really your perception as a paleontologist. So, so Paul he published this and lots of discussion and. Everybody was quite happy about it. Um, but, but of course, it's a perception thing. Okay? These are fossils. And you could argue that that's, um, that might have been caused by um, the animal being a juvenile for one more stage, for example. And that might have been due to temperature or something. So maybe these are not real evolutionary changes. Maybe they're just what we call equal phonetic changes, just environmental changes. But nevertheless, it is an interesting thing. But all the years before, people just fit their observations into this Darwinian model. Well, then what happened? Back after Darwin, <clears throat> things were at a standstill. Okay? This gradual change business um, didn't seem to work. Make it work if you can. If you, um, but then evolution got stolen from the naturalists, okay? the geologists, the paleontologists and turned over to the geneticists, as everybody knows. And there was an enormous amount of genetic work uh, for the first half of the last century. And by the time the 1940s rolled around, the geneticists felt that they owned evolution, okay, and, and a lot of disciplines own, feel they own things, like the weatherman thinks that they own climate change, and people like that, you know. Um, so the geneticists, the geneticists thought that they owned evolution, and they came up with a modern synthesis. Okay, this is what they call it. The modern synthesis is that small mutations are, are responsible for these morphological changes, and that's end of story. Okay. Now, of course, the, the, the naturalists don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, the naturalist often wonders, hmm, you know, these lab people often get kind of, they can't see the wood for the trees. Okay. But fortunately, the, 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 the geneticists had enough research money, and enough of them were in universities to keep on doing work. And in the 1990s, it, and with improvements of technology and so on, and genetics had a, another flowering. And it was what we call evolutionary developmental biology. So then we finally have a mechanism for not necessarily gradual change, but for <coughs> fairly substantial change because the geneticists realize that, that certain genes have a lot of power and they can, they have all, they can do great things to, to lineages uh, when, they, when they undergo a mutation. So that now we can, we can account for fairly substantial changes in morphology because of evo-devo. Well, let's go back to, to Darwin again. What did, what did paleontologists do? Okay, because that's what, what I'm here to tell you. Well, they didn't win. <coughs> well, they did. They kept on working. It was business as usual. They, most of them didn't care at all about Darwin. Darwin, of course, cared about them, but they didn't care about Darwin. So here was, for example, the frontispiece of Elkanna Billings. It's a little bit light, 1865. Elkanna Billings is called Paleozoic Fossils of Canada, Geological Survey. He was Canada's one and only professional paleontologist. Um, he made the mistake of taking law as a, as a student, practicing as a lawyer for a while, and then he got out of it, luckily, lucky for him, and, and became a, a paleontologist. And he was a very, very good one. Darwin knew him, and had his books, and Darwin may have even corresponded with him. I'm not sure about that. But, 
Um, Billings was a highly regarded paleontologist, but he died relatively young, unfortunately. He was in his 50s. But he just kept on working because the Darwinian mechanism didn't really mean anything to him because he's just describing fossils and, and where they are in the rocks and where they are in the different places and what age they are. That's what, what paleontology was a practical discipline. And here happens to be something. I wrote a, a, a monograph, and it's exactly the same approach to what Billings was doing and to what hundreds of other paleontologists did in, in the 1800s and most of, well, even now, we still do the same thing. Here is a page out of a, a geological survey of Ohio book that I happened to pick up one second hand, 1873. 